be here, but he had an important meeting come up that was uh, be very beneficial to his business, so that took priority. Uh, but Tony's actually been a client of mine for almost a year and a half. So uh, I brought these referral cards with me uh, that I helped him put to get, I helped him put together. And you notice it says on the back, drop off when you drop off your taxes. So they're a little outdated. But uh, Tony does a lot more than just personal and business tax returns. Okay, so feel free to continue to use those referral cards if you know somebody uh, business-wise or personal uh, that, that needs tax accounting help. He does a fantastic job. As Jennifer said, my name is Nathan Mitchell. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present to all of you here today. I'm going to start by just telling you a little bit about who I am, where I come from, um, and what I'm doing now and my, my goals for the future and those types of things because I figure if people don't know you, they don't really listen to you, right? So I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. I actually grew up in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, how many people have been there? <laughs> it's not too far from here, right? Uh, nearly all of our family still lives there, but I lived in Springfield for 26, 27 years before my wife and I moved here. I grew up in a very uh, small business-oriented family. My father was and still is uh, a business owner in the commercial construction industry. So that was one of the things that I really had an affinity for small business and entrepreneurship growing up because I grew up around it. I actually went to Missouri State University. I kind of have an interesting story. I tell people that uh, my life is a mixed bag of success and failure because I nearly flunked out of school. In fact, uh, I earned 1.8 my first semester. Uh, the college put me on academic probation. I went to a community college where I got a 1.0 my second semester, right? So by this time, I'm thinking, man, you need to make some better decisions in your life, right? Uh, so I really put myself in a bind where ultimately when I decided to go back to Missouri State, guess what? They didn't want me, right? If I had stayed there, I would have been kicked out of the school for good. Uh, but I was talking to my brother and my dad. I'm like, oh, what do I do? I really put myself in a bind here. And uh, my brother suggested that I write a personal letter to the dean of the college and explain the mistakes I had made, what I had learned, and what I was going to do moving forward to, to change it. And lo and behold, two, two weeks before the fall semester started, I guess that would be 1995, I got a call from the administrative assistant at the dean's office, and they told me you will be accepted back into school for one semester, assuming that you are at a minimum of 3.0 GPA you have to stay. <laughs> okay? And uh, so I kind of scraped back in by the skin of my teeth. I got the 3.0 they required of me, and uh, the rest is history. Now I'm working on my doctorate. So how do you go from failing out of college nearly to, uh, to going on and pursuing other things? Uh, so I ended up going back after graduating to get my master's degree in business administration from the same uh, institution. I actually transferred with the Walgreens company where I started out of undergrad. I worked my way up through assistant management to become a store manager. Ultimately, I was what they called a community manager, and I oversaw six stores in South Tulsa. I ended up leaving the Walgreens company in 2000, I believe 2011. Uh, it was just time for me to move on and do different things. How many of you have been there before? Where you wanted to move on, do different things, was making a good income, but it wasn't making me happy anymore. And once you have children, I think sometimes your perspective on what's really important changes. And that's where I found myself in my life. So about the same time, I actually started Clutch Consulting in 2010. I was flying underneath the radar at Walgreens doing both. Uh, praying nightly that the company wouldn't find out because I wasn't in a financial position to move away from it yet. And by the grace of God, nobody found out. So. Uh, about that same time when I left, uh, an adjunct opportunity position came up at Brown Mackey College. Well, they actually reached out to me just because they were interested in having somebody come in and talk to their students on small business. They actually reached out to me on Twitter, of all things. So I go in, I speak for 45 minutes on small business. The next thing I know, they want me to start teaching the next month, which was a great opportunity because, hey, you know, I just left a great job in the corporate sector. I can continue building my business. And my purpose in life is to empower other people. So it was in alignment with what I do as an individual. And I still, to this day, continue to teach there in addition to consulting with organizations because I just love impacting students that much. Uh, so it's because of Brown Mackey College that I'm actually able, I'm attending the online program at Argosy University right now to pursue my doctorate. Uh, 
and it's a benefit of being a teacher there. I mean, I tell people, if I had to pay for that out of pocket, there's no way in Hades I would do it, right? But it's actually a benefit of being a teacher at the college. I'm able to pursue uh, and continue my degree. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, these are the two reasons why I do everything that I do, uh, my two children. That's Eileen and Nathan. Eileen just turned seven, April 5th, and Nathan, we call him Mater Tater. Uh, he turned four on April 15th. So we actually just got back from Missouri visiting family and having birthday parties. So anyway, as you can tell, this was taken last summer at Silver Dollar City, right? Right. Not really. <laughs> uh, and you can tell my wife has aged a lot better than I have. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit about me and my family and who we are. So uh, I'm really going to talk to you today about maximizing business results because it's important. Right? How many of you want to increase the bottom line, right? Maximize revenues. Uh, gain new clients, all of the above. And it's really, it's become a, a challenge for a lot of people, especially since 2008. I mean, the economy is getting a little bit better, but who knows what uh, will happen in years to come. And I want to start out by saying this first bullet point is regardless of what's going on in the economy, the political environment, or the existing market, businesses need to drive bottom line results, okay, regardless of what the economic conditions are like. And despite whatever those conditions are, there will always be businesses that thrive and businesses that don't thrive. So I hear a lot of organizations tell me it's because of the economy that our business is not performing at an optimum level. Right. Well, is that true or not? Maybe, maybe not, right? Because I guarantee you, regardless of how bad things are, there's always companies that are going to be making money and making lots of it. So I'm not one that's very quick to say it's because the economy, my business isn't getting the results that I desire. A lot of times it's because maybe I'm not doing the things that I need to be doing or the organization that I'm working with is not doing the things that they need to be doing. And unfortunately this is the challenging business environment that we currently experience. And these are some interesting stats that I pulled from uh, The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. It's a great book. Business fails every three minutes. Management members and directors change about every 32 seconds. A company changes control every 15 minutes, and 96% of businesses fail within 10 years. So I want to start out by asking all of you here, what do you think are some of the primary causes for small business failure? Not staying current and uh, not looking to the future. Not staying current and not looking into the future. Okay. Undercapitalization. Undercapitalization. Thank you. You get a copy of the book. Oh, cool. For, uh, wow. Speaking up and being the first one. <laughs> Anybody else? Too much time working in their business instead of on their business. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, typically when you're in a traditional job, you have maybe a few roles that you're responsible for, right? Uh, but then when you get out into the world of small business, you're doing things on your own. And what was once two or three roles may now be 10 or 15 roles. And a lot of times, uh, small business owners especially will, will focus on things throughout the course of the day that are not sales generating activities. Um, I remember working with Clay Clark early on in my consulting career. And one of the things he told me that I'll never forget is I did non-revenue producing activities for about 8 p.m. to midnight mm -hmm. every day. Right, and I focused on making sales calls all the other 12 hours of the day that I wasn't that I wasn't working. Okay, so and unfortunately, this, this is what we're dealing with: this whole idea of uncertainty, right? Especially since uh, 2008, things haven't necessarily gotten any easier. And here's where I want to point out that everybody wants more control. We say we want control of our business, right? We want control of the results, but a lot of times we use the economy, market conditions, the political environment as excuses for the reasons why we're not getting the results that we desire. But I want to share with you that if you really want control, well, that means ultimately that you have to do what? You have to take responsibility, right? And when you take responsibility, you ultimately have control, okay? So in my professional opinion, these are some of the typical causes for poor for poor performance, it's the location of our business. It's the season, it's the economy, 
It's the employees we've hired. It's a new competitor down the street. I'm not just a good salesperson. Okay, so these are really what? Excuses. Excuses, They're excuses right? Uh, I love this quote by James Malachek. He was on ABC Secret Millionaire, I guess, probably two or three seasons ago. Uh, but he says, stop blaming any lack of achievement on outside factors like other people, the environment, the economy, the geographic location, etc. Take responsibility for what you are or are not achieving in your life or business and then take action to overcome that challenge. But a lot of times we still find ourselves doing this. Right. Okay, I know I'm not getting the results that I need to be getting, but ultimately, how do I change it? So why so many? For starters, it's lack of a clear organizational purpose. Okay, a lot of organizations focus on the how and the what, but we ignore the why more often than not. You hear a lot about mission statements, and a lot of times, especially how many of you have been in a corporate environment? Okay. A lot of times you have mission statements and they're lengthy things on the wall, they're on a nice plaque and nobody knows what they are and nobody reads them, right? So we hear a lot about organizational mission and stuff, but really a clear purpose is what drives your business. For example, one of the first things that we did when I worked with Minor Associates is we went through a two-day transformational power of purpose workshop where every employee in the organization discovered what their unique purpose was in life. And the purpose of the organization was determined by Tony's purpose in life, which is to relieve other people's financial stress. So we came up with the tagline, relieving financial stress. So lack of a clear purpose, lack of awareness of the market that they're in, more specifically the target market, who, are, who is their ideal target market? Are they targeting and identifying the right people who really need to utilize their business services. Going into business for the wrong reasons, burnout from too much work, and bad advice. How many of you have experienced any of these? Okay. Um, going into business for the wrong reasons, you can even look at it from the standpoint of accepting a job for the wrong reasons, right? Oh, it's great money, so I think I'll take it. And then 24 months later, you're like, I wish I hadn't taken it. Uh, that's kind of the position I found myself in with Walgreens. I had worked there for nearly 12 years. And I was making a six-figure income. Okay? Sometimes it's hard to walk away from that. Especially when you have a wife who stays at home and two young children to support. Um, so a lot of times people will get in positions where that necessarily go into it for the right reasons, and then later on they ask themselves, can I even get out of the situation that I'm presently in? So I'm going to start by asking you this, and this is the Gwenpool Chamber, okay? <laughs> when I presented, it was a different, I was actually speaking on employee engagement at the workplace, but I was presenting at uh, the Bixby Chamber, and one of the attendees said, I asked this question, I said, why did the chicken cross the road? Okay? And everybody, you know the answer, right? Why did the chicken cross the road? Get to, to get side. to the other side. Somebody in the audience told me that is not a chicken, that is a rooster. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and I didn't grow up on a farm, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> that whether it's a rooster or a hen, it's still a chicken, right? Mm -hmm. Am I right? I'm saying that? Okay. Uh, so anyway, but why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? And we don't ask ourselves in business nearly enough why we are crossing the road. And that's what I ask you now. Why are you crossing the road as an individual? Why are you crossing the road in your day-to-day -day activities and the business that you manage or the business that you own? What is it specifically that drives you? I told you that Tony's purpose is to relieve financial stress. My purpose is to grow businesses and empower people. That's what I do. That's what drives me on a daily basis. That's what drives Tony relieving financial stress on a daily basis in his organization. I have a really good friend here in Tulsa. His name's Jim Witt. Does anybody know who Jim Witt is? Okay, Jennifer. Uh, Jim's been consulting with organizations for probably about 28 years, I believe. Uh, he started about the same age that I did. He was, uh, I believe, 35, so we have a lot in common. 
we spent quite a bit of time together. He's really served as a mentor uh, to me, at least the last couple of years. But Jim says, without a purpose, our only motivation is reward and punishment. And you can equate this to the business world, right? So this is why purpose is so important. In my opinion, it puts out a lot of organizational fires. Number one, we mentioned earlier, lack of a clear purpose. Finding the purpose of your organization solves that one, okay? Lack of market awareness, not necessarily. Uh, but going into business for the wrong reasons, absolutely. Burnout from too much work, yes. It's your purpose that sustains you. Uh, is everything <coughs> in my business go the way that I want it? No. Does everything in Tony's business go the way he wants it all the time? No. Does everything in Jim's business go the way he wants it all the time? No. But it's our commitment to continue fulfilling our purpose in life as, as business owners that keeps us committed to overcoming the adversity that we have at any time in our life or our business and keeps us focused on what's important. And this is actually a book that Jim uh, has written called Writing for the Brand, uh, The Power of Purposeful Leadership. I actually use it uh, in some of the consulting work that I do. We've put Tony's group through the process. So purpose is not just a philosophy. Organizational purpose can also be all about strategy. Okay. <coughs> and one of the things we do is Tess, was it you that mentioned earlier about focusing on the future? <coughs> focusing on the future was that you? I did. That's why you got the book. Yeah. Right? I'm already forgetting. <laughs> so uh, one of the things we did with Tony's organization is we ask these four questions. <coughs> a lot of times in business we think mm -hmm. three to five years ahead, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in the corporate world, a lot of times you think quarter by quarter. Okay, how did, how did the Wall Street results come out? What's happened to the stock price? And that stuff's monitored quarterly. But we like to look at basically a 60-year window. And you might say, well, that's crazy. Why would you look at a 60-year window? Mm -hmm. How many of you look back five years in your life? You remember five years ago, right? <laughs> how much has really changed in five years? A lot. A lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it seems like yesterday, hasn't right. it? Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trust me, I've been in areas of my life, too, when I didn't have kids. Now I have kids and my whole world has changed. A lot can happen in five years. A lot of times when I, you guys are unique. A lot of times when I ask that question, the majority of the room says not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. You know, or how do you expect the next five years yeah. to be different? Well, maybe not a whole lot. So we asked, what changes have occurred in the world and in your industry since 1984? So we asked Tony's group, you know, what changes have taken place in the world and in the world of accounting in the past 30 years? Well, a lot's changed in 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. Since 1984, especially in the, uh, when you start looking at the economy, or technology, I mean. What changes will take place in the world and in your industry by the year 2044? And once you identify all these things, this is the key central question. What will your business have to look like in order to succeed in that environment? Okay. And we even start talking about things like, are, are the corner banks yeah. going to even be in existence anymore? Uh, I mean, that's financially related, right? It's somewhat related to, to the accounting industry. So we start talking about things like that because you're already seeing, take a picture of your check with your phone, yeah. right? It's automatically deposited in your account. Uh, so will brick and mortar banks and drive throughs at some point become a thing of the past? And if that can happen to the banking industry, what can ultimately happen to the accounting industry, right? So what will your business have to look like to succeed in that environment? And what goals and strategies do you need to implement to get there? In other words, to make that happen over the long term. Uh, so anyway, we did this in 2013 with Tony after we went through it, that's why I didn't say 2044, but I had this uh, mock-up of the Time Magazine cover made for him uh, and gave that to him. So it says Minor and Associates named 2043 Firm of the Year. <laughs> and then he wrote an article called How We Became Great by, uh, by Tony Minor. So how do you maximize results? We've talked about purpose. <laughs> We've talked about questions that we can ask as business owners, managers, and leaders as to 
how the world or industry might change, how it has changed, and what we can ultimately do to move forward and to improve. But in my opinion, there's five keys. You have to, grow, you have to realize that growing your business is not a default activity. But it has to be a proactive prescription plan. Your strategy must be based on the purpose of your organization. In other words, whatever we do, whether it's marketing, whether it's uh, offering new services to clients, we have to make sure that it aligns with what Tony's organization does. Does the marketing that we're engaging in, does the new services that we're offering to the local community, does it help us fulfill this? Okay. You must have a system for acquiring your ideal client and customer. It must be trackable. Uh, I am amazed at the number of people that will put billboards up. And billboards are not cheap, right? And I actually met with an organization probably about six, nine months ago, and they were all excited about, we just invested in 12 billboards all across Tulsa. Great. Yeah. I don't know, maybe that's a $10,000 expense. I don't really know, but it's a lot. It's a lot on a monthly basis, right? And I asked them, great. I said, how do you know how much income those billboards are driving to your bottom line? They had no idea. Not to mention that they didn't even put URLs or anything on each individual billboard that they could direct traffic to to know that that specific ad has generated these leads from our organization. They don't know, okay? So your, your strategy and your system must be trackable. You have to understand that commitment is the first key to reaching your business goals. Without an all-out commitment to your purpose, growth will not ultimately come. And it all starts with our beliefs, okay? So what I'm gonna do, do you have pens? Does everybody have a pen? You can go grab some. I'll go grab some. I think I brought one with me. This tank they're going to right? Just take one of these and pass it down. Thank you. So the first thing we're going to look at is what I call a beliefs inventory exercise. Real simple, it's only to come up with five things. What are five beliefs that you must have in order to build your business in 2014? And it's hard to believe the first quarter is already behind us. So, a couple of examples here. We thrive regardless of the economy or the political state. No one brings to the table or to the market what we personally have to offer. Businesses want the services, solutions, and products that we offer or provide. So think, think of your respective organizations or your individual businesses and what are some beliefs that you have to have as an organization that will help you build your business this year. I'll just give you a few minutes.
Tess, would you like to start us off by giving us one thing on your list? <coughs> uh, sure. <laughs> um, I believe what I have to have in order to grow my business is always give 100% in everything that we do. Jennifer? Our definition of value is when members receive more than what they paid for. Yes, ma'am. Uh, drive and determination. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> then we will perform better than anyone else will. Okay. Yes. In mine, I'm going to say communication. Communication? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and you started off that way because it, it, it's interesting to me. That's where we get so bogged <clears throat> down so much of the time in us, you know, with the other employees, with the customers, whatever. But just like you getting back into college, you know. You had to communicate where you were at in your life yeah. and let someone else know, yeah. you know, and that's what made you successful was that, that communication. Yeah. So when you talk about communication, are you talking specifically like within the organization from supervisors to team members? Both, or, okay. Both yeah, with, with internal and with customers and stuff. Okay. So. Okay, the second one, and we may not get through all of these. Usually when I give this, it's about an hour and a half uh, interactive workshop. I know we are. We don't have as much time today, so down. So the second thing that we will look at is what I call benchmarking your top performers. I mean, a lot of times in business, it's easy for us to kind of walk around with blinders on, right? We get ingrained in what we are doing and what our organization is doing, but we fail to pay attention to what the top performers in our industry, or perhaps even the performer, the, the competitor down the street, is maybe doing that we are not doing that we can capitalize on. And as a result of that, we are getting left behind. So uh, I encourage businesses that I work with to benchmark top performers. And this could be even thinking way outside of the box. I mean, who's the elite five in your industry? Now, maybe you're a small business, but it doesn't matter. You, you're trying to benchmark yourself against a Fortune 50 company, right? So think of the top performers in your industry. What are the five things they do extraordinarily well? And then, more importantly, how does your business compare to that? But anybody like to share some of the things that your competitors do extraordinarily well? Okay, go ahead. Um, there are member touches and member contact, member communications, economic development, innovative ways to communicate, host events, and educate their members, strong lines of communication with their elected officials, and they're known as the number one go-to source for anything within their business community. Anybody else? Yes? Just they're able to. I put 
specific people, but thinking, you know, generally speaking, um, they've been able to reach a mass market versus just staying global, so they've been mm -hmm. able to expand. Yeah, there's some, and I'm somewhat familiar with your industry because a lot of what you do and I do, we may market ourselves very similarly, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of um, coaches, consultants, marketing consultants that have done extraordinarily well at promoting themselves online very, very well, and driving traffic and revenue through the business from sometimes all over parts of the world, Yeah. right? And it can be a challenge. Yes, sir? I just, because my business is more retail, but I put marketing, pricing, service, hours, and reputation. Yep. You and I need to talk because I was in the marketing. I was, I was in the retail industry for twelve years, so I, I feel uh, I know your industry very well, obviously yeah. from my experience, and uh, very challenging at times. Well, once again, it's funny because you talked about billboards, and I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm in the, the food industry, so I put uh, mobile transportation with rapid vehicles, uh, central hub, mobile app for ordering, reward structure for clients, and marketing. Yeah. And you bring up a great talk about marketing the, the mobile wraps. Mm -hmm. You know, and, yeah. and the last vehicle I had, I actually had, I didn't have a mobile wrap, but I had marketing on all of my back windows. Mm -hmm. I had a Jeep uh, Liberty. It's like a hundred fifty dollar one time expense, mm -hmm. you know. And a lot, a lot of times I think it's actually more. People think it's more expensive than it actually mm -hmm. really is. Uh, but it, depending on your industry, it didn't end up really doing a whole lot for me because as a consultant, I'm not an impulse buy, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't drive down the street and go, "Oh, a consultant, I need to call him right now." It just doesn't right. work that way. So I haven't even. Uh, I got a new vehicle a while back. I haven't uh, spent the dollars to have it redone. Okay. Anybody want to share anything else, or are we good? Uh, the next one, and this is actually probably something that you will just take with you, but I do want to explain it because it is maybe these questions aren't as easily answered. Okay, it's basically the best way to put it. And I don't know. Can I give myself an image up here? Yeah, I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because some of you may be sitting here for this presentation today and you're like, I don't know, uh, much less know what my individual purpose in life is. I have no idea what the purpose of my organization is. Okay? So you may not know the answer to this question. But whenever you decide to do this exercise, I encourage you, uh, if you don't know, how is it that you best serve your customers, right? Uh, the second piece is... What drives your economic engine? And I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say you're in the accounting industry. Personal tax returns and business tax returns cannot be the only thing that drive your business revenue, right? Because that's about what? Three, four months out of the year mm -hmm. tops. Okay, so even though as an accountant you might do a lot of business and personal tax returns, what really might drive your economic engine are the services that you can offer local businesses in the area that drive monthly residual income for your organization. Okay, retainer type services. Can I offer payroll management to this organization? Can I offer uh, bookkeeping? Bookkeeping, exactly right. Invoicing services, those types of things. So, what you may do now, or what you think you may do now, is what ultimately drives the bottom line in your business. It may or may not be. Okay, so really look at what drives your economic engine. In the retail industry, it was our average sell per customer. Mm -hmm. We were always trying to drive that up, right? We wanted more items in their basket every time they came in the store. So we always try to find uh, creative ways to drive up the average sell per customer. Yes, ma'am. So do you think it's more, do you think margin is more important than timeliness there? Do I think margin is more, more important, important than timeliness? Like, than, than like timing. Like you said, like his business and, and personal tax returns are only three, four months out of the year. Um, and for us, we have, you know, big events that happen, but then there's also the membership dues that, you know, come throughout. Yeah. So I'm just questioning it. if something's a higher margin, 
can you say that that's economic engine because it, it's less work and so it brings you in a lot of money, even if it may be a short snippet of your time, or is an economic engine more of like the day-to-day, -day, like you said, the residual income that can come from bookkeeping every single week? Well, I think to some degree it has to be a combination of both. Uh -huh. uh, if you don't have margin in your business, guess what? You're not going to be operational mm -hmm. very long, right? right? Uh, you, you can do pricing analysis and those kind of things and look at well, what happens to my bottom line if I increase price of service A by $150. How many people will possibly fall out of my membership or fall off as a client? But there can be situations where you can actually increase your prices, right? Have 10 or 15% of your clientele fall off and at the end of the day you still make more right. money than you were before in serving fewer clients okay, and having fewer headaches as a business owner. And then the last one is, what do you excel at? You know, when you're, what do you do best? I mean, you consider these three things, where is your sweet spot? Okay. Uh, me, for example, I tried to promote myself for the longest time as like a, a keynote speaker didn't work for me because that's not the type of person that I am. I found out I was really good at doing stuff like this. I'm more of a facilitator type person. Okay, I, I facilitate discussion. I can uh, do workshops in that type of environment. The 45 minute uh, up in a room keynote, that, that wasn't me. That wasn't my sweet spot. That wasn't what I was good at. Which is probably one of the reasons why I love teaching so much, right? Because when I'm in a college classroom, it's a lot like this environment right here, isn't it? Okay, so look at what's the purpose of my organization? What drives my bottom line? What do we really excel at? And then where, what's my sweet spot? What do I do really, really well? And how can I capitalize on that? And then once you recognize what this is, identify at least three new ideas that you can do this year that will help you maximize your sweet spot. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, and then the last one we talked earlier about lack of market awareness, right? Tess, I won't call on you this time. <laughs> I didn't put any picture of this one up. So anyway, on this one, you know, sometimes your ideal target market is not initially who you thought it was. So in this exercise, what you'll do, and again, this is one I think is going to really take some thought. This is not an easy one to fill out, so I encourage you to take this one with you. But I want you to consider the characteristics of your top ten existing clients. So who are your top ten clients? Who are your top ten members? Who might be the most active members of the Glenpool Chamber organization. That might be your top 10, right? Who are your top 10 retail clients? Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be people who drive the most money to your bottom line, right? Right. Sometimes there's other things that are important, like right. integrity, mm -hmm. okay? So consider the characteristics of your top 10 clients and list what those characteristics are. And then, after looking at that, outline in detail what would the attributes and the characteristics of your ideal client really look like? So based on uh, your top 10 existing clients, if you could basically um, create, oh, where am I looking for? Clone, right? <laughs> A clone of your best clients in your organization, what would that look like for you? And then what lessons are emerging? So in other words, what gaps exist, okay? between the customers that you have now and the ideal customers that you want to attract. And then the last one again is similar to what we talked about earlier with the, I was going through the four questions, you know, what's happened in the last 30 years, what's gonna happen in the next 30 years, mm -hmm. what does your organization need to look like to succeed in that environment, and then what strategies and goals do you need to put into place to make that happen? So in other words, what do you need to do to change the situation, what do you need to do to attract the people who are more aligned with who your ideal target market really is, okay? And 
And that's really guys, that's a lot to throw at you in 40 minutes. Okay? <laughs> Which is why those last two exercises, uh, I just want you to take with you and really think about those, uh, put some thought into them. So with that, what, what were some of the things, what, a couple of takeaways? Tess, you don't have to. Yes, yes, oh, I think one of the simplest things that you said that's so critical for me and for what we're going through right now is that you can't have control without taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. And for people who want to be leaders and do the things that, you know, they may say they want done, if they don't take responsibility, it's, it's really hard to um, give merit to that. Anybody else? What was that phrase about um, reward or punishment? Yeah. What was the beginning part of that? Purpose, was? our only motivation is reward and punishment. Without a motivation, what? Yeah. Without a purpose. Okay. Without a purpose, our only motivation is reward and punishment. And I will give you an interesting example. A while back, my daughter, who just turned seven, was craving an iPad. Okay? So we came up with this ingenious idea. We're like, well, we're going to give her $10 a week for doing various activities around the house. Right? And she was only, she was probably five at the time that we actually did this. So we didn't end up spending a whole, she usually maybe hit a couple of weeks out of the month where she really did everything that she was uh, asked to do. But the cool thing was, is my brother, her uncle, said, you know what, I'll match it. But technically, she could get $80, right, a month between the 40 that we would pay her and the 40 my brother would chip in. So technically, she could get an iPad or what? Three months, probably, right? One of the, the, the lesser expensive ones. So anyway, this has probably been, oh, a few weeks ago, I noticed that you know, she really hadn't been doing those things anymore. And I asked her, I said, you know, why aren't you helping your, your mom set the table or helping her clear the table off and, and all the above? And she said, I already have my iPad. <laughs> oh, you know, and it made me start thinking about, okay, so what is the real purpose behind asking her to mm -hmm. engage in those activities? So I, I bought a book, and I suggest all of you read it. It's called Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us by Daniel Pink. And he shares some very interesting studies in the book. One of them I'll touch on because it's the whole reward and punishment deal. More contingency rewards, not necessarily punishment, but years ago, it's like a 50-year-old study. These psychologists were in a classroom, and they were behind a two-way mirror, and they were observing what a group of four-year-olds were doing in the elementary school classroom, and they tracked what they did during their free time, not what they did when they were engaged in their math homework or whatever in the classroom, what they did specifically during recess when they had free time in class, and they noticed a group of students that loved to draw. They were always drawing, doodling, painting, whatever. So then they go back and they say, okay, we're going to take these 12 students and we're going to divide them into, uh, what to say they had three groups, three groups of four students. And they set them in a room. We're like, okay, we notice, we've been watching you, we notice that you love to draw. So the first group, they tell them, we notice you love to draw, we want you to continue drawing, and guess what, when you're done, we're going to give you this shiny certificate. Okay. Expert drawer, right? The second group, they said, we've noticed that you love to draw. We want you to draw for us. Nothing else. The third group, they said, we've noticed you love to draw. We want you to draw for us. Went back several weeks later. They found out. Uh, now, here's what happened. The first group, they were told, we want you to draw, right? They drew. They got what? Shiny certificate, mm -hmm. right? The second group... They were told to draw, they drew, but they weren't told at the beginning that they would get anything as a result of drawing. They still got a shiny certificate, but they weren't told at the beginning that they were going to get a shiny certificate as a result of drawing. And the third group got nothing. No promise, no shiny certificate. So they released these children back into their natural school environment within a period of weeks what had happened was, is the A group stopped drawing entirely. Hmm. Something that they loved for so long because they were promised something and it was contingent and they got a shiny certificate for it and they weren't even passionate about it anymore. Hmm. And the second and third groups, they continued drawing. Hmm. And um, 
made me think about my own child rearing, right? Like, wow, how many things am I not doing right? You know, I talk about this kind of stuff all day long and the business environment and leadership environment, right? But sometimes we miss it in our own household. A very interesting study because you can look at uh, how much do bonuses, right? How much do annual raises really drive human effort in the workplace? Next to zero. Next to zero. But no, that's a great, great point. Without a purpose, our only motivation is reward and punishment. Mm -hmm. For my daughter, it was an iPad. <laughs> and that was short to What you say? Daniel Pink? Daniel Pink. Daniel Pink. Daniel Pink. The book is called Drive. The Surprising Truth About All Motivates Us. Great read. Let's see. And if you want to, if you guys want a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, I'll be more than happy to send it to you. Uh, I actually, in the past when I've done this, and I've run out of these, I don't have enough to give everybody but I would actually have this on a DVD-ROM that has the, the presentation, PowerPoints, audio, the, the slides and everything. But if you want, so that's why it says complimentary gift request. Uh, just send me an email, say, hey, you know, I saw your presentation at the Blimpool Chamber. I would like a copy of the slides. And I'll send those to you, okay? That's all I've got, guys. Uh, I did bring some books with me. Five of you. You notice you gave her a book and she didn't answer any more questions. Her motivation was See? <laughs> So anyway, I've got a couple of textbooks that I've written. Uh, one's on leadership, one's on customer service. So you're more welcome to take your pick, but everybody can take one with you, okay? okay. So I'll just leave these up here. Thank you. And that's all I've got. Thank you guys Thanks. so much. Great. 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 Great job. Thank you. Stuff. Stuff. Guys, feel free to take another plate if you want. There's plenty of food left. Um, thank you for coming. And then next time, the next food for thought that we have, feel free to bring friends. Let let other people know about it. Um, I believe it is Richard Oldman with Blue Sky Technologies. It's going to be um, kind of how to utilize the cloud, IT services, all that kind of stuff to maximize your business. Um, we don't have a date for it yet, but that is going to be after Black Gold Days. And I think we're looking at July. But thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you. That was and great. I did put, uh, well, actually, Jennifer put for me my business coaching and consulting referral program. I laid this uh, out for, for all of you. Actually, I emailed Jennifer this morning. I ran out of toner, car, uh, toner on my printer at home, so I asked her if she could make me some copies. But if you know of anyone that is looking to uh, grow their business, do leadership development, communication in the workplace, those kinds of things, Take one of these. I do offer a 10% commission on any referrals that are sent my way that ends up in a contract. If that's a monthly contract or whatever, you get 10% every month that I'm active with the client. So awesome. that can be beneficial for you as well. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate having all of you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tess. See ya. Sorry I was too hard on you. <laughs> She'll be stronger next time. That's what I think. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, you sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. You bet. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Ms. Jennifer? Thank you, man. Yeah, thanks for coming. It's good seeing you. Waiting for service.
speakers that have to come to lunch and they're like, I don't want to say names because you're probably not. And I hear their stuff and I'm like, oh, that's great, that's great. But this is really quality stuff. I just want to your stuff. But I can also tell that if any of them were to follow up with you, that, I mean, I know what you've done for Tony, but you never know, you can never trust well, the person's name. I was the gentleman over the end. Gary. Gary. Yeah. I need to get his name again. Yeah, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you all theirs. Okay. So you can follow up with a thank you, you know, whatever. Um, but that's really good. Because, I mean, he's, a, he's an ideal client. From that like a good communication yeah. organization. Yeah, they're both of the Robertsons. So I know Shane, you know, I know a couple of them. So that could be, he, 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 he'll be the foot in the door. You'd actually have to meet with um, um, the, uh, the Robertsons themselves. But they're, I mean, they're good people. Yeah. I thought he'd be a great client for you. Um, okay. Yeah, but, I'm more than happy to. Yeah, I'd love for you to come speak uh, at the lunch. Ship. I know I'm speaking on customer service for Mixby, I think, in September. Okay. What does June or July look for you? Is that crazy? No. Because May we have Cindy Morrison coming, and then June. Um, Is she talking on social media? Uh huh. Yeah. Um, but she's really carving niche out for herself. I mean, she's she's met some prominent people, and she's done some great things. I know she really is. Um, but if you want to maybe look at the second Wednesday in either June or July, and let me know if either of those dates work for you. I'll follow up with them. Um, How much time do you get at the luncheon? <sighs> it's tough. It's 30 minutes because we try and do everything in an hour. And we have the students of the month. We have the uh, yeah. updates. Um, the city report has been pretty brief, although this will be our new, our new senior staff office. We'll be able to with it kind of version or not. Um, we have had situations where people look out in 40 minutes where I just make sure there's nothing on the agenda. We go, we start at, you know, at 11.50 and just push everything through. So I mean I can start five minutes early at low speed, you know, then you can say yeah. um, so the max probably would be about forty minutes. Is there anything you can do with forty minutes? Well, I knocked this out in forty five. Yeah. Really. I mean and it was tough. Great. It was tough. Because yeah. usually well when I presented it uh, to Tony's clients, we had a private event for his business clients and about 30 of them showed up and we did that last spring. I can see how this could go long, for sure. Yeah, I mean, well, we, had, we had a lot of two hours and really, I mean, I, I think I went about an hour and a half. Okay. But you know, if I have enough handouts to give everybody, the thing is, it gets people thinking yeah. in yeah. ways that they don't really think about the business. And I'm still trying to narrow it down because it's still pretty broad. I, mean, I cover a lot of, you can give me some feedback, but I cover a I lot think, of different things in it. I think you are as narrow as you can be for a, a, a um, diverse audience. Now, if you knew that everyone in the room was going to be a restaurant owner, yeah, you can get narrower. But speaking to a chamber or speaking to a whatever kind of organization, I think, I think, I know if I were... A business owner here, I mean, I would want to follow up with you. And, and for example, I don't. I need to talk to some people in my industry, but I'd love for you to facilitate our board retreat. Like your what? Our board retreat. Because everything you said there, you know how um, a prophet's not known in his own land. I mean, I can say it a million times over my board, but they won't listen to me. But if you come in and say those things to them and get them thinking and ask the hard questions, it's a totally different. A lot of members of your board are also leaders in the local community. Right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well. So much to the point that one of them has come out in one situation and said, your name needs to be on it, not the chamber. And I said, no. When we have successes, it's not Jennifer Cook. You would live that big for that. Right. It's the chamber. And when we fall, it's the chamber. And you, they don't, they don't take responsibility. So, um, but you <coughs> talk about your purpose and, and everything. I show up with that every single year because we go through the order tree. We've got our mission statement. We've got our mission statement. We've got our, our, our three goals and our supporting strategies and our tactics and everything. And then halfway through the year, here we're having conversations that are purpose related. And I'm like, why <laughs> every single year? That we spend an entire day, eight hours working on this. Yeah. So I don't know. I just think that everything you said, I'm like, oh my God, this is so We could facilitate the whole four questions. Mm -hmm. How have membership yeah, organizations changed in 30 years? Exactly. Because I was talking, uh, I met Pete. Pete and I, we just learned our fellow Shriners. He's uh -huh. a Shriner, I'm a Shriner. So we 
we hit it off. And we were talking about that with memberships with the shrine. Yeah. They're having significant problems with bringing new members in. Really? Uh, existing members are getting older, not bringing in the younger crowd. Mm -hmm. And eventually. A lot of mentorship. So, I mean, I know that Chambers probably to some degree experience as well. We were just talking about how people don't even know their neighbors in their own community anymore. Mm -hmm. People don't have time like they no. used to have time. They're, they're so connected asking, by technology. They're not connected by fence posts anymore. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's tough. And we're just, we're dealing, it's growth, it's growing pains right now for Glen Pool. Um, but, I don't know, it, it's not till October. Um, but I do want to keep attention because I, I'm keeping all those and I'm going to fill them out. Like because this. every single sheet that you gave out it's not going to get thrown away. Like normally, I throw them stuff. Okay, you're great. I'm going to either take them or I appreciate them. But I'm not kidding. I mean, you you are probably the deepest that I've heard um, knowledge oh, and I'm application. <laughs> well, but there's so many people out there who the show and the glitz and the glam, and I'm sure they can help your business, whatever. But you remind me of my mentor, Dr. Green, and just the depth of knowledge and how when he says something, I can trust it. Like your whole thing, bad advice. How many businesses go under because of? They, they talk to us a sham, you know what I mean? And they, sh they paid that sham $500 a month to tell them, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you are exactly right. But I will follow up with you with their contact information because I think, I think. Yeah, I think Robert's entire. I right? think he's a potential, and I know they have I mean, He was money. taking notes over there like yeah. left and right, so. They, they have money, but they are very smart about how they spend it. Sure. I mean, they, 